All right, so we're gonna we're gonna get going. Um, thanks everybody for coming to the uh, to the first uh, portal and HMS Center for Bioethics Health Policy and Bioethics Consortium of the Year. Um, it's great to see such a uh, such a big turnout for this. We actually we ended up getting 140 uh, 142. RSVPs, um, and so we're going to be taping it, and hopefully people who uh, were not able to fit into the room will be able to catch it uh, later. Um, if you do want to uh, tweet about anything that uh, that comes up, the hashtag that we use for this series is hashtag policy ethics, um, and we want to uh, also acknowledge the support provided um, by the Oswald Kamen Fund uh, at Harvard University for this uh, seminar series. Um, so just to give you some background, so my name is Aaron Kesselheim. I'm, um, I'm a physician and lawyer, and I'm the director of PORTAL. Um, PORTAL is a research center uh, based at Bring Women's Hospital um, that's focused on the study of the intersection of law, therapeutics, and public health. Um, we have three, three full-time faculty members, uh, five postdocs, one of which is going to be the moderator today, Mike Sinha, um, numerous students who work with us. So if you're interested in any of these topics, um, you know, please reach out uh, and let me know. You can see here some of the um, this is some of the stuff that we do. This is a, a recent JAMA article on, on cost savings from using uh, uh, inexpensive generic drugs instead of expensive brand name combination medications. Um, and there's an, a, an opinion piece um, that we wrote in, uh, in Bloomberg. Um, and we teach courses at the HMS Center for Bioethics, um, of which uh, this serves as one as well. Um, here's our website, um, and you can follow us uh, on Twitter as well as sign up for the mailing list so that you can be alerted to subsequent um, Policy Ethics Consortiums. So just to give you a background, the objectives of this consortium um, are to articulate key issues um, in the healthcare system and public health that involve ethically challenging policies or practices, um, bring together experts, and we've got two fantastic ones today, um, with different perspectives or experiences to consider and propose solutions to these, um, to these uh, ethical and policy dilemmas, um, and then to try to stimulate conversation and further academic study of the topic to help advance the field. Um, so these events occur um, every, uh, every second Friday of the month during the school year. Um, this is the, the first one, and this is our agenda for the rest of the year. So uh, save the date in October. Um, Larry Gostin and Vanessa Carey are going to be talking about um, global health security. Um, in November, we're going to be talking about provider consolidation with Limor Daphne from the Business School um, and Eric Gold from the U.S. Attorney's Office uh, in Boston. And then in December, talking about um, uh, expensive medical treatments in the context of this drug called Luxterna um, with Steve Pearson um, and Jason Commander um, from Mass Ioneer. Um, and again, if you, if you uh, sign up with Portal, you'll get uh, uh, notices of all of these. All right, so I want to introduce um, our topic today, the U.S. opioid epidemic. Where do we go from here? Um, first, we're going to hear from uh, the moderator, uh, Mike Sinha, and then we'll hear from our, our two um, expert discussants. And, and thank you all very much for joining us. All right, I'm going to start off with a little uh, introduction on the opioid crisis, which uh, at this point is really a public health crisis and is worsening as we speak. Um, these are some of the most recent statistics from NIDA. National overdose deaths reached approximately 72,000 lives in 2017. You see that there are more uh, males than females, but they're both certainly on the rise. Um, overdose deaths involving opioid pain relievers have doubled since 2002, but are climbing at a far slower rate than some other drugs, such as heroin. You're seeing a, quite a substantial climb, 16,000 lives relating to heroin lost in 2017. And to give you some uh, comparison, other synthetic opioids and predominantly fentanyl and you see here the fentanyl deaths in 2017 are approximately double the number of deaths from heroin. And that's rising much more substantially. Another concern is polysubstance overdose. Opioid involvement in cocaine overdose is also climbing significantly. You'll see the yellow line there, co cocaine in combination with any opioid. And this is all often due to uh, illicit preparation of opioids, uh, fentanyl, with uh, cocaine. 
You're also seeing a significant rise in benzodiazepines, which is likely due to concomitant prescription of both benzodiazepines and opioids. In Massachusetts, I'm afraid the problem looks even more serious. It looks like we've got an approximate death rate of about three times the national average in the United States. And you can see here on this map that it's worsening over time and it's really affecting most areas of Massachusetts. In response, Governor Charlie Baker proposed his own bill known as the CARE Act. CARE is an acronym standing for C, Combating Addiction. One of his proposals was to introduce a commission to study medication-assisted therapy such as methadone, buprenorphine, and injectable naltrexone or Vivitrol. Accessing treatment, he sought to increase treatment in jails, prisons, and emergency rooms, among other things. A goal to reduce prescriptions of opioids across the Commonwealth, including partial fills for first-time opioid prescriptions, meaning that someone can be dispensed 10 pills, and then if they need more later, they can go back to the pharmacy and obtain the remainder of their script. And finally, enhancing prevention, increasing uh, strengthening the standing order for opioid antagonists, including Narcan, in pharmacies across the Commonwealth. Uh, so uh, Governor Baker's proposal had tremendous support from the Massachusetts Medical Society. One proposal in his initial bill that was not passed was a proposal to authorize medical professionals to hold a patient for up to three days for substance use treatment only, and this was not included in the compromise this was something I raised with the Massachusetts Medical Society and passed a resolution at their annual meeting in June. So again, as I said, standing order means you can walk into a pharmacy and obtain naloxone, and this is what I did uh, just a few weeks ago, right across the street at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And there's a local organization, Western Massachusetts. We are allies. They give you a little package that you can carry along with you on your bag, and it prompts you to ask questions. So it's fostering a dialogue about opioid addiction in, in Massachusetts and nationally. Congress is also on the verge of passing its own bipartisan opioid package. The Senate bill has gone through multiple committees. Over 70 senators have contributed to the language. It seeks to increase access to treatment, heighten border control for fentanyl and derivative carfentanyl and increase research on non-opioid pain treatments. But a lot of advocates argue that it doesn't go far enough because it doesn't really pay for expanded addiction treatment. The CBO estimate for the bill is $8 billion over five years. Advocates are saying we need tens of billions of dollars infused to reverse the tide of the opioid crisis now. Other coming things, these are just news clips from the last few months. Cost issues, Narcan maker Adapt Pharma was acquired by Emergent Biosolutions. Who knows what that means for access or price of Narcan moving forward. OxyContin's manufacturer, Purdue Pharma, obtained a patent for a drug to treat opioid addiction. As many of you know, their drug OxyContin perhaps contributed to the rise of the epidemic in the first place. President Trump's opioid plan also focuses heavily on injectable naltrexone or Vivitrol, a very expensive drug for which the costs and benefits are not well established, in addition to access issues. So New York Times recently, ER treating an opioid addiction being very rare. Also in the New York Times, most doctors ill-equipped to deal with the opioid epidemic and few medical schools teaching addiction. And finally, and for the reasons given above, doctors have been slow to adopt medication-assisted therapy for opioid treatment. So with that introduction, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Andrew Kolodny, senior scientist at the Institute of Behavioral Health at the Heller School of Brandeis University and co-director of the Opioid Policy Research Collaborative. His primary area of focus is on the opioid and heroin crisis, which is devastating families and communities across the country. He is also the executive director of Physicians for Responsible Opioid Prescribing, 
an organization with a mission to reduce morbidity and mortality caused by overprescribing of opioid analgesics. Dr. Kolodny previously served as medical office, chief medical officer for Phoenix House, a national nonprofit addiction treatment agency, and as chair of psychiatry for Maimonides Medical Center in New York City. He began his career working for the New York City Department of Health and M Mental Hygiene in the office of the Executive Deputy Commissioner, where he helped develop and implement multiple programs, including citywide buprenorphine programs, naloxone overdose prevention programs, and emergency room screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, also known as ESPERT, for drug and alcohol misuse. Dr. Kolodny completed his medical training at Temple University in Philadelphia and his residency in New York City at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, where he was chief resident. He completed a fellowship in Columbia University in New York and is board certified in psychiatry. Our second speaker is Dr. Jesse Gaeta, who is the chief medical officer of the Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program, where she has practiced internal medicine since 2002. She oversees the clinical practice of this unique community health center that serves 12,000 people annually across dozens of clinical sites, including homeless shelters, the street, and one of the first medical respite programs in the country. Dually board certified in internal medicine and addiction medicine, Dr. Gaeta graduated from the University of Maryland School of Medicine in 1998, trained in internal medicine at Boston University Medical Center, and served there as chief resident in 2002. She remains affiliated with Boston University School of Medicine as an assistant professor of medicine. She also completed a physician advocacy fellowship at the Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons in 2007. Dr. Gaeta has a long history of advocating for the needs of individuals experiencing homelessness. She has been published and spoken widely on the intersection of homelessness and health and she directs BHCHP, Boston Healthcare for the Homeless Programs, Institute for Research, Quality, and Policy in Homeless Health. She has led their efforts to respond to the opioid overdose crisis, which has been magnified among people experiencing homelessness in Boston. Her passions include ending homelessness and bending the curve on overdose deaths. And we'll start with uh, Dr. Kalani. So it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to talk with you about the opioid uh, crisis. I know the uh, uh, the title for uh, today's uh, seminar is uh, "Where Do We Go From Here?" And you know, I th I'm not going to, in my opening remarks, really answer that question. I'll touch on it briefly. Uh, that I think will be what we'll be discussing. Uh, what I'm going to really start with, though, is talking about what the opioid epidemic really is, because. Um, I don't really think we can talk about where we go from here if we're not really all on the same page about where we are right now and what's actually going on and, and what is the opioid crisis. Um, the opioid crisis is sometimes described as a drug abuse problem, and this is the way the pharmaceutical industry likes to frame the, the crisis, that this is an issue of people uh, taking dangerous drugs because it feels good. Uh, abusing these dangerous drugs, and they're accidentally killing themselves, and we, we've got to stop that, that bad behavior. It's a, it, that's the opioid crisis, people trying to get high off of, of these really good medicines uh, is the way they would frame it. Um, you'll all also hear the opioid crisis framed sometimes as really a problem of, of despair, that uh, the real issue is uh, socio socioeconomic distress in middle-class white Americans and that their, um, as their plight has gotten worse over a few decades, that they're drugging themselves and drinking themselves and committing suicide and, and that that's really what the, and that the opioid crisis is just a symptom of this broader societal problem. You'll also hear the opioid crisis described really as an overdose death epidemic. Um, and, uh, which I think is really a mistake to just really zero in on the overdose deaths. In, in my view, that would be like framing 
the AIDS epidemic as an epidemic of PCP pneumonia. PCP pneumonia was how many people uh, with AIDS were, were dying, but we had an epidemic of people with HIV infection. That's really what the AIDS epidemic was. And so I think the correct way to frame our opioid crisis is as an epidemic of opioid addiction. It's an epidemic of opioid addiction, meaning that all of these different health and social problems, um, you know, the soaring increase in overdose deaths, the um, the increase in, in infants born opioid dependent, um, the large increase in children entering the foster care system, the soaring increase in deaths involving fentanyl, the impact on the, the workforce. The driver behind all of these health and, and social problems that we are really talking about when we, when we talk about the opioid crisis, I believe has been a very large increase in the prevalence, the number of Americans suffering from the condition of opioid addiction. And that's what's really driving all of these different problems. And I'm going to show you the opioid addiction epidemic happening over, over time with a, a series of maps. So I, I believe our opioid addiction epidemic began in 1996. This is three years into the epidemic. And on this graph, the states that show up as red or maroon are the states that have the highest rate of people showing up at a state licensed drug or alcohol treatment program saying that the primary drug that they're addicted to is a prescription opioid. So the states with the most serious problems show up as red or maroon, and you could see that three years into the epidemic in 1999, there were a few states lighting up with a pretty serious uh, problem. And I, I want you to watch what happens to the color of the map as we go forward in time. So this is 99, 2001, 2003, 2005, 2007, and 2009. So by 2009, in every state in the country, there had been a very sharp increase in the prevalence of the number of Americans suffering from the condition of opioid addiction. When you have a sharp increase in a disease over a short period of time, that is the, the definition of an epidemic. Now, now what's caused the maps to, to turn red like that? And what's really caused our opioid addiction epidemic? The, the, uh, the, let me just move ahead a little bit. Actually, I'll get to it in a moment. But the slide's a little out of order. So um, I'm going to explain what's caused the maps to turn red in, in a moment. But we have three groups of Americans who are opioid addicted. And this is something that really gets lost in the discussion. Um, because what, particularly when we focus in on overdose deaths or the drug involved in an overdose death, we're really forgetting that there really isn't a single population of, of drug users who shift from one drug to another. Uh, we have, I believe, roughly three groups of Americans who are opioid addicted. The first group is a group that's uh, primarily white. Um, they're in their 20s, 30s, early 40s. Their addiction begins with prescription opioids, and many of them wind up turning to heroin um, after becoming addicted to prescription opioids. Because if you're a young, healthy-looking person, um, it, even if your addiction began with medical use of pills as opposed to recreational use, it, it's hard for a healthy-looking 25-year-olds to get a lot of pills from a doctor on a monthly basis, so they wind up on the street uh, where, where um, uh, prescription opioids are very expensive, and so they, they switch to heroin. And, and this is a group that um, has been transitioning to injection heroin use uh, as well at a very high rate. The second group, uh, also uh, affected post-1995, also developing its addiction to um, through use of prescription opioids or middle age and up. And this is a group that really doesn't have to switch to heroin after becoming addicted to uh, the pills. It's a group that is able to get pills pretty easily from doctors. And, and many in this group are really developing their opioid addiction through medical use. And then the third group are individuals who really are survivors of the heroin epidemic of the 1970s. They're more likely to be non-white. Um, they're more likely to be male than female. They're, it's mostly these, these older men. Um, and in the first group and the third group, we're seeing overdose deaths soaring because of fentanyl in the heroin supply. And in this third group, you have uh, the, these men who managed to survive despite their heroin addiction for 40 or 50 years. Uh, many of them survived AIDS, which killed tens of thousands of injection uh, 
drug users. They've seen many of their friends die of overdoses over the years. They've made it to their 50s and 60s despite their, their heroin addiction, probably with periods of, of abstinence or treatment and then relapses. And, and in this group, the deaths are going up very rapidly now because of fentanyl in the, in the heroin supply. So uh, in inner city DC, North Philly, South Bronx, um, in, in many different parts of the country where that population, where you'll find that population, the deaths are going up. Now, um, this is a slide I don't like. It's, it comes from the uh, CDC's website, um, and it's based on sort of a new framework for the opioid crisis, which I don't think is very helpful, where the opioid crisis is described as happening in sort of these three waves, uh, a prescription opioid wave, and then a heroin wave, and then a fentanyl wave. And, and the reason you might frame it this way is if you're just looking at the drugs involved in the deaths instead of really understanding that there are different populations affected. And if you think of the opioid crisis as really just an overdose death problem, maybe that makes sense. But again, overdose deaths are, are really one piece of this problem. Uh, there are many other problems associated with, with an epidemic of opioid addiction aside from the fact that we've got record high overdose deaths. So I don't think this is very helpful. Um, I think that we really do have to think about the opioid crisis uh, in a more complex way. Um, the, let me just go back to this also. The explanation for this trend that's very popular, you see the top line, which is prescription opioid deaths. You see how it's sort of leveled off at the same time that deaths involving illicit opioids began to take off. The explanation you'll hear for that, this trend is that the drug users switched. So we... The, there was a crackdown on the pills, so the drug users went from the pills to heroin, and um, and that's what, what's going on. That's what explains these overdose death trends. And that's a conclusion you would draw if you're only looking at, at overdose deaths, but that really isn't what, what's going on at all. The, the reason we've seen this sharp rise in deaths involving illicit opioids is because the illicit opioid supply became so dangerous with fentanyl. And even though you see this lag between heroin and fentanyl, which, which shows up as black, that, that lag may have more to do with the fact that fentanyl wasn't being tested for regularly when it first emerged and then medical examiners began to test for it. It is not true that there was a sudden shift from prescription opioids to heroin in the context of a so-called crackdown. The rise in heroin use, the switching, began much earlier. So, and you see that here on, on this slide. On the right is uh, uh, non-Hispanic blacks. On the left is whites. And I, and I want you to look at the red line, which is the age group 20 to 34 years old. And you'll see among young whites in the United States, heroin use began rising very rapidly. At, from, at the beginning of the prescription opioid crisis, these were young people who were switching. And if you look as well on that graph, if you look at the green line, for whites, middle-aged white people, you don't see rising use of, of heroin. Again, that's a group that is more easily able to get pills from doctors after, uh, even after they, they've become addicted. Um, something that many people don't realize is that when you compare the rate of overdose deaths or the number of overdose deaths that have been occurring in this young white group that switches to heroin, when you compare their deaths to the middle-aged and older whites who don't switch to heroin, up until the uh, fentanyl emerged, we were seeing many more deaths in the people getting pills from doctors than we were in the young people out there using heroin on, on the street. And you can see that on this graph. So the light blue are opioid pain reliever deaths, the dark blue is heroin, and you can see significantly more deaths involving prescription opioids, then heroin, and, and the age group where we were seeing the most deaths was that middle-aged group. Um, this is an infographic that the New York Times put together, and what it's really showing you is this young group now catching up. And the young group has surpassed the older group now that we have this extremely dangerous heroin supply. And you can see over time uh, with fentanyl, uh, many more deaths now occurring in, in that young white group and in the older non-white group. So this was the, the slide I um, meant to talk about previously. What's causing our opioid addiction epidemic? What caused those maps to turn red? And this is a CDC slide. And the CDC has been perfectly clear about what's causing our opioid addiction epidemic. The CDC is showing us here 
that as the prescribing of opioids, the consumption of prescription opioids began to increase in the United States, which is the green line, that rates of death, which is the red line involving prescription opioids and addiction to prescription opioids, the blue line, that they went up in, in parallel. The CDC has really been saying that this is an epidemic that's been caused by us, the medical community, that as we started to prescribe opioids, much more aggressively as the prescribing went up, rates of addiction and overdose deaths went up right along uh, with the increase in the prescribing. And the CDC's message has been very clear as well. Their message to us is that we may not be able to bring this epidemic under control until the prescribing trends much more cautious, until we really get to the levels of prescribing where we were before we had this epidemic. I can tell you that pharmaceutical companies that manufacture opioids don't agree with the CDC. And initially, up until around 2004, they were actually arguing that this association didn't exist. And scientists who were getting paid by pharmaceutical companies were putting out papers saying that the prescribing is going up, but we see no adverse public health consequences associated with the increase in prescribing. And when it became started to become clear that there was an association, they were arguing that these are not pills from doctors' prescriptions, but they're pills being stolen from pharmacies. And um, they've now stopped making those arguments. They've now acknowledged the association between the increase in prescribing and these adverse public health consequences. But they're, what they're arguing is that the prescribing doesn't have to come down. Um, they're, they're saying that if we make the pills hard to crush for snorting or injecting, if we teach doctors to monitor their patients more closely, we can have our cake and eat it too. The green line can stay high, it can continue to go up, um, but we can make the red line and blue line go down. And, and unfortunately, that won't work. And it's, it's not just that the manufacturers are saying these things or that their experts that they pay are saying these things. They're also putting their money where their mouth is. They're spending quite a bit to try and block state and federal interventions that might result in more cautious prescribing. This um, data comes from an investigation by the Associated Press and the Center for Public Integrity, which found that over the past 10 years, the opioid lobby, the manufacturers and distributors, outspent the gun lobby. They spent eight times more than the gun lobby in their efforts to block regulations that might result in, in more cautious prescribing. They had spent 880 million over the past 10 years. I mentioned earlier the pharmaceutical industry frames our opioid crisis as a, as a problem of drug abuse. Um, this is more specifically how they'll frame the problem for policymakers. And this is a slide uh, that was shown at an FDA meeting uh, by the head of a pain org, making the argument that FDA shouldn't put drugs containing hydrocodone, like Vicodin, hydrocodone combination products, shouldn't put them into the Schedule II category, which is more restrictive. They were, the point of this slide was to argue that FDA, if you put the drug in a more restrictive category so that doctors can't uh, do six months worth, you know, five refills on a prescription and, and phone it in easily, if, if you do that, you're, you're going to be punishing the pain patient for the bad behavior of these drug abusers. It was framed as if all of the harms were limited to so-called abusers, which of, of course was, was never the right way to frame this problem. And millions of people with, with pain have become opioid addicted. Thousands have died of, of overdoses. And these are lousy drugs for, for chronic pain. Prescribing has started to come down, fortunately. Um, this is the drop in oxycodone prescribing in the United States, the blue line. And you can see um, the comparison to oxycodone prescribing per capita in, in Europe. And despite the drop, we are still not even close to, to the levels of prescribing in Europe. Um, this is just oxycodone. This is um, more data showing you the you know all opioids and morphine equivalents. And, and you do see that the, the, prescri the prescribing has started to trend down, but we have a very long way to go before we're at the levels, uh, the pre-1996 levels. Um, there was a federal review. Um, federal government looked at all of the evidence to support long-term use of, of opioids for chronic non-cancer pain. This is the, the uh, review that they published, and the conclusion is highlighted here. They looked at all of the evidence, and the conclusion was we cannot find evidence that putting patients with chronic pain on long-term opioids is helpful. Um, we did find evidence it's dangerous, and the higher the dose, the more dangerous it is. If you think about that for a moment, if you think about any medical intervention, where you don't have evidence that that medical intervention is going to help a patient, but you do have evidence that that medical intervention is dangerous. Those are medical interventions that we should prescribe rarely, 
Opioids are still routinely prescribed, though, for, for chronic pain. There's been a focus, and we're going to be talking about this, I, I think, uh, in, a, in a moment, um, a focus on more cautious prescribing for acute pain, states passing, limits on first-time prescriptions. The, one of the reasons why thinking about uh, more cautious prescribing for acute pain is so important is many of the people who wind up on long-term opioids began um, not with long-term chronic pain, and they've tried everything, and a doctor said, okay, let's see if opioids will work for you. Often it begins with a, an acute pain problem, even post-op or injury. And um, this was a study published by the CDC. They found that if a pa they looked at the initial prescriptions, uh, initial episode of opioid use, they found that if a patient um, took an opioid every day for 10 days, one in five patients were still on an opioid one year later. And they looked at uh, patients who had taken an opioid every day for 30 days, and if you took an opioid every day for 30 days, 40% of patients were still on an opioid one year later. Um, this doesn't necessarily tell us these people all were addicted, but it, it certainly speaks to the physiological dependence. That's a, a serious problem with these drugs. How do we end our opioid addiction epidemic? Well, I think one of the reasons it's really important to frame the problem the right way is because if you do frame this as an epidemic of opioid addiction, what we need to do about it becomes much more clear. We have to prevent more people from becoming opioid addicted. More than anything else, the interventions there will be interventions that result in much more cautious prescribing so that we don't directly addict patients and so that we don't stock homes with a highly addictive drug where family members can become addicted. And then, of course, we have to see that people who have this disease are receiving effective treatment. These first two bullets are really similar to how you would respond to any disease epidemic. Um, think about an, uh, an infectious disease outbreak, an Ebola outbreak. What would you do? You'd contain it to prevent more people from getting the infection, and you'd see that the people with the infection are getting life-saving treatment so it doesn't kill them. It's really very similar for, for our opioid addiction epidemic. The difference, though, is that you know there is a role um, I think for keeping the reducing the supply, and I'm not by saying that speaking in favor of a war on drugs. I think it's pretty clear that the war on drugs failed and and it uh, contributed significantly to mass incarceration. But there is a role for law enforcement. You do want the black market price for pills or and heroin to be high. You do want efforts to try and keep fentanyl out of the country. Um, making it harder for people who are opioid addicted to access prescription opioids uh, from pill mills or or um, or to, to access heroin while making treatment easier to access would result in many more people seeking treatment if you, uh, and, and we could talk a little bit more about that in, in the discussion. Uh, a couple of final points. Um, this is the AIDS epidemic, and you, you're really looking at deaths from from this is death, deaths from AIDS, and you can see we peaked around 1995 with about 45,000 deaths from from AIDS at the peak of the AIDS epidemic, and that's where we are right now with deaths involving opioids. We're at about 45,000. The total number of drug overdose deaths is higher, but opioid deaths are at about 45,000. We're we're basically where we were at the height of the, the AIDS epidemic. And if you look at this um, slide, you'll see that deaths from, from AIDS plummeted. And why did they plummet? We had the introduction of antiretroviral therapies, medications that would allow us to finally uh, treat HIV infections so that it, it wasn't a terminal disease. It became a chronic uh, condition. Um, I believe that we have medications available today um, that if there was better access uh, we could see a, a similar trend. And the medication that I think really would be most valuable in that regard is buprenorphine or suboxone. And when I say that better access to buprenorphine might allow us to see a similar plummet in, in deaths, I'm not just speculating. It happened in France. In France, uh, buprenorphine uh, was released in the mid-'90s. Um, and um, there were no limits on, on who could prescribe it. Doctors didn't have to take a special class, an eight-hour course. There were no cap on the number of patients they could treat. It, it was out there. Doctors began to prescribe it very widely. And within six years of the release of buprenorphine, there you had a 79% drop in deaths from heroin. And you could see here the, the line going up is, is buprenorphine prescriptions, the black line going down are deaths involving heroin. Um, these are some of the different interventions. We'll talk a little bit more about them in the discussion. Uh, these are states where prescribing is trending up or, or, or down. You see Massachusetts, the prescribing. Uh, Massachusetts is in dark blue. You're, we're in the best category. And, and by the way, Massachusetts is doing a little bit better 
right now. One would predict that Massachusetts would have a much higher death rate than other parts of the country because we have much more fentanyl. It's, it, almost all of our heroin has fentanyl in it or is, is, is fentanyl being sold as, as heroin. So you would predict that the opioid crisis would be worse, which it is in terms of overdose deaths, but you'd also predict that it would uh, the, the trends would be moving in the wrong direction, and they're moving in the right direction. So overdose deaths in Massachusetts in Massachusetts have stopped going up for the past year, year and a half, may even be trending in the right direction. It's too soon to, to celebrate. But I, I, and I don't think it's necessarily because of the drop in prescribing. That helps prevent new people from getting addicted. I think it has more to do with uh, the fact that in Massachusetts there is better access to buprenorphine and to treatment than in other parts of the country. Washington State uh, has also tr uh, done a really good job of focusing early on before other states were on the issue of high dosage prescribing. Back in 2010, the state put out a policy requiring doctors who had patients on doses greater than the equivalent of 120 milligrams of morphine that they would have to take this extra step and seek a consult from a pain specialist. And so they basically legislated an upper dose limit and that's been, uh, appears to have been very effective in reducing overdose deaths in, in the state of Washington involving prescription opioids. This is the national overdose death trend. Um, we're f it's flattening. Um, you know, it's possible we, we're beginning to turn a corner nationally in, in overdose deaths. It's too soon to tell, but this is the best it's looked in a very long time. So, so maybe, um, overdose deaths are not, you know, I have a feeling they're going to go up again when we have the 2018 full data, but maybe if we're lucky, 2018 will be the worst year in history and we'll begin turning a corner on the epidemic. Um, so I'll, I'll stop here in summary. This is the worst drug addiction epidemic in the United States history. Uh, to bring the problem under control, um, we need ever evidence-based um, uh, interventions and we're really not there yet. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I um, just want to thank Michael, uh, Dr. Sinha, for inviting me here today. I'm thrilled to come. This is like a passion subject for me, and also um, was grateful to meet Dr. Kalodny um, and all of you. So I'm going to um, sort of bring this big picture that Dr. Kalodny has painted of the epidemic down to the Boston streets. Um, to try to give you um, a very downstream, desperate, street-level first responder perception of what's going on and where we need to go from here. And um, I'll just very briefly mention that the program that I work for um, has a very simple mission, which is just to provide or short access to the highest quality health care for homeless men, women, and children in the greater Boston area. And to kind of frame um, a little bit this problem from my vantage point, I thought I needed to give you some context um, to explain a little bit about what this practice is like um, and um, to sort of explain more about the homeless population in Boston, which is, um, you know, for whom this epidemic is really magnified and was seen quite a bit earlier just the case in so many different, um, different conditions. So just to give you some context, for, for me um, and my colleagues um, at the intersection of Mass Ave and Albany Street in Boston, um, this is an epidemic that still has not let up. And even though the statewide numbers are flattening for the first time, that's not happening in our population yet, which is not surprising. So drug overdoses actually, um, we know this, we're so lucky to have data like this on our own practice. Um, drug overdoses are actually the leading cause of death. Um, we know this from a very large scale mortality study that we conducted um, actually a whole decade ago now. So between the years 03 and 08, this disease killed more people um, in the homeless population in Boston than anything else. Um, that study was, we published it eventually in JAMA Internal Medicine in 2013, and we started to see this data come back in 2012. Um, and it was just so highly 
um, motivating for us. I think I even have a colleague in the audience um, from those years, Dr. Donji here. I think we were feeling that anecdotally, but to see um, this data come back for us was a big driver. We, at that point in our history, had been primarily a primary care practice that had grown out of the departments of medicine at Mass General and Boston Medical Center. And um, this data really, we took a very hard look at ourselves. We took a very hard look at our own prescribing practice, wanted to know how much we might be contributing to this epidemic um, in a population with a very disproportionate amount of chronic pain. We also um, just sort of took to own addiction as a core part of our program's identity. So there are 30 doctors in my practice. Um, 16 of us have gone back to do um, uh, to become board certified in addiction medicine. We began in 2012, really, prescribing naloxone or Narcan rescue kits to um, just very broadly across our practice to everyone. We started to triple, quadruple the size of our office-based addiction treatment OBAT programs in which we provide um, either buprenorphine or suboxone or injectable um, naltrexone or Vivitrol. Um, so these programs were just growing by leaps and bounds um, in the aftermath of seeing this, this data. In fact, in the building where I spend most of my time, there are still today between two and five overdoses every single week. It's, uh, it's so common that I wear Narcan on my, on my chain here because I don't always have a bag with me. Um, I'm frequently stopping next to the parking lot where I park to resuscitate someone. Um, I'm very often resuscitating people in public bathrooms nearby when I go to grab a lunch somewhere. I mean, so we are just drowning in overdoses, despite a lot of shift in programming in recent years. And so this is just the key figure from the mortality study I mentioned, which I think paints this like beautiful picture in one figure of the evolution of a new epidemic in this population. So what we're looking at here are mortality rate ratios. Um, looking So a rate ratio of one on the x-axis there means that uh, mortality from the causes that you see on the left was the same in two different time periods, because we had actually done the same study about 15 years earlier. So this is looking at the rates of death for these causes compared uh, for 03 to 08 compared to 88 to 93. And what you see is that in 88 to 93, so a, a rate ratio to the left of one means that it was more common in the previous time period. Um, so the rate ratio for HIV and HIV-related deaths was far to the left there. There's been a big mitigation in deaths, um, as Dr. Kladny showed you nationally. Um, in this population in, in Boston. And I think the reasons for that, as have been mentioned, include obviously the advent of highly effective antiretroviral therapy. In my mind, they also include things like the Ryan White program that allowed us to bring meds and ex an impressive sort of medication adherence work right to the street. It also included policies having to do with prioritization of people with HIV for housing and many other policies. So deaths from HIV, this was the good news in the study, were mitigated to a large extent. But they were almost perfectly offset by a shift to the right in the same amount um, of a death from drug overdose. The size of the box here, by the way, um, corresponds to the number of deaths from each cause. I point out, just because it's interesting, that cancer and heart disease in the very center of this um, figure were a very close second and third um, most common cause of death, and those did not move across the two time periods, which is kind of devastating to see if you're a primary care doc working in this practice. Very motivating data. To paint the picture, I thought it would be good to share some photos with you as well from a news article um, that the Globe ran on the front page and several subsequent pages. It was just a kind of devastating article in, I think this was June of 2016. Um, the title of this article I thought was just so stigmatizing and so nihilistic, Life and Loss on Methadone Mile. And the reason people refer to this part of town um, as Methadone Mile is that is really stigma. There's so much stigma in lots of different 
um, segments here in Boston um, against methadone, which is you know, arguably the most effective treatment that we have for opiate use disorder. And there is a clustering of clinics that can treat people with methadone and other addiction programs in this part of town. There's also, interestingly, a clustering of homeless shelters. So within about 500 feet of the building that I work in, there are 1,100 um, homeless shelter beds for adults. So there's a real clustering of both addiction services and homeless services in this part of town. And it's gotten this sort of moniker of methadone mile, which is very negative. So all of the pictures in this, in this story um, are, are my patients that, that we know well. They all have the same hopes and fears as you and I do. Um, some of them are avid readers. Um, and their stories are just tremendous. The article focused, though, in a very negative way. And this was a, a difficult article for us to, um, to see. Um, so that's sort of a little bit about the, the context of, of where I'm coming from. And I guess what I want to move to next is explaining um, two different recent innovations that we've kind of out of desperation really put into place um, in our practice. And so again, I'm explaining that we're seeing an unprecedented number of overdoses, in fact, every single day. Um, we're growing as quickly as we can access to treatment. So we now have a census in our practice of about 500 people at a time who were treating with buprenorphine, about 100 who were treating with injectable naltrexone or Vivitrol. So we have, and, you know, Al hasn't been there for a few years, and that number is tremendously larger. We're doing this inside of um, many of the shelter clinics that we work in. We're doing it on the street. We're trying to decrease every barrier, basically, to getting access to this treatment and behavioral therapies as possible. Um, but despite all of that, the numbers really aren't coming down in, in, in my world. Um, and so... And that's sort of the place where um, we start thinking about innovation and the need for, for different things. So I'm going to describe to you, um, and I thought I would just read a short um, couple paragraphs that I wrote to explain this, um, about why we started a, what turns out to be a very provocative program called SPOT in our building. SPOT stands for the Supportive Place for Observation and Treatment. I'm going to tell you about it in a minute. Um, but I wrote this recently, so I think what I have began to believe about being innovative um, is above, above all else, recognizing and responding to needs that have gone unarticulated, um, that haven't been voiced or haven't been heard or, or sometimes uh, needs that have been silenced. And so there are a couple stories that um, kind of illustrate these unvoiced and unheard needs. The first story is one that plays on repeat for the last several years now, and that kind of ultimately led to the creation of SPOT. I see it so here, clearly in my mind because it's, it's happened so many times. I'm on the floor of a public restroom in our building. I'm hunched over a young person uh, who I've just revived from an overdose using Narcan and rescue breaths. And as he begins to wake up below me, He's feeling the withdrawal from opioids acutely. He's both disoriented and, one second, my phone's a little funky. There we go. He's both disoriented and afraid. He's half-dressed at this point because we've taken off his shirt. He's shaking like a leaf. He's dripping in sweat. And he's really completely vulnerable in that moment. And I feel frustrated, as do the staff around me, because this person is a stranger to us. He isn't well engaged in our clinic, because even our services, which are so far from mainstream, are fairly structured. It's hard to imagine that this man sitting in the waiting room um, of our clinic, um, there are elements of the way that we operate in the larger healthcare system that simply make him reluctant to engage with us. So when he refuses to go with EMS, and by the way, in Boston right now, in 2018, year to date, 60% of people uh, who overdose for whom 911 is called do not go to the hospital. That's how, much, that's, the, that's how much of a problem we have with people accessing any kind of healthcare for this disease. Um, and there are so many reasons for that. 
So when he refuses to go with EMS to the hospital because of fears of being stigmatized there and also because he's really not sure what the heck they can do for him, I'm afraid to see him walk out the front door. I don't know whether I'll ever see him again, and all I feel is desperation, really, to let him know somehow that we're going to be there for him no matter what happens in the coming hours and days. I want to know him better. On another morning, like so many others, um, as I've, I'm walking from the parking garage to our building, I'm, I have to steer folks who are heavily sedated away from the dangers of that very busy intersection. So all around me, people are crippled um, by addiction, by this epidemic of addiction. They are, um, they are making their way from street to street with heavy bags slung over their shoulders. They're seeking ways to appease their addiction today, to keep it at bay just a little longer, to sue themselves for weeks, months, um, and years of unimaginable trauma. It was countless mornings like this that gave birth to Spot. Um, this morning's kind of registering these unvoiced needs of people around our building, um, sometimes even my own not fully articulated needs as a doctor. Um, and so let me tell you about Spot and sort of what's unfolded. So this is a, an explicitly harm reduction program within a healthcare setting, um, which is not an easy thing to pull off. It has three simple aims. The first is to prevent fatal overdose. The second is to try to engage a very high-risk population that we're not well engaged with, to get to know them better, ultimately to try to help them access treatment, and to try to tackle stigma um, even within our own program. Um, and I'll just say kind of outright that even in a very mission-driven place like a healthcare for the homeless program, there's so much stigma about uh, and really against opiate use disorder and people who use opioids, that that, that is not an insignificant task, even in my microcosm. So we essentially kind of dreamt up a, um, uh, a space that we knew needed to be street level, very low barrier to walk into, um, and we just had a conference room, really, is the only space that we could use to convert into this kind of programming. Um, we have space for only 10 people at a time, and essentially people use heroin and fentanyl and other sedating substances around our building, and afterwards they either walk in or are brought in by a peer or brought in by an outreach worker or wheeled in by a police officer, um, whatever the case may be. But they come in typically um, still able to talk but already heavily sedated, um, and they often say, listen, I took a little bit more of this and that than I usually do, and I'm not really sure what's going to happen. Do you mind if I stay here? And it's sort of that simple. And at the point where a person can't walk or talk anymore, we, um, we start to monitor their vital signs continuously. So we know exactly when we need to use supplemental oxygen, Narcan, IV fluids even. Our hope, though, is, and, and our hope obviously is that people are going to be able to walk out for another day and that we can engage with them when they're more awake on the way in and on the way out and that we could create some pipelines that are pretty fast track into various types of treatment people might be interested in. So we staff, for, for the medical folks in the room, we staff this, this space with a registered nurse who is, specializes in addiction. We have quite a bit of non-clinical staffing. Um, and really, our harm reduction specialist, we call her, is sort of the linchpin to the program, the person that most people trust the most and are willing to, to engage with more. Sometimes we have peers in the room, uh, and then we have a rapid response clinician in the background in the building to respond when things go south, which is not uncommon. So these are some pretty striking and uh, worrisome vital signs that are common in this room. Um, so in yellow here are blood pressures. You're seeing a few here that are just quite low. Um, the pulse is in green, and it's common in this room for us to see pulses in the 30s and 40s. Um, and then in blue here is oxygen level, and these are actually normal oxygen levels. So one of the first things we started to learn when we could actually monitor people in the course of an overdose is that at least in our microcosm on the corner of Albany Street and Mass Ave, people are combining five substances. They're sold together um, as a uh, cocktail. They're called the cocktail. Um, and they consist of an opioid of any sort, most typically heroin or actually fentanyl. Um, 
a benzodiazepine of any sort, although clonazepam or clonopin is definitely preferred and has the highest market value. Um, gabapentin or um, Neurontin. Um, clonidine, which is another prescription medication with several different indications that I think is driving a lot of the vital sign abnormality we see, and we're trying to show that at the moment, um, but that prescribers aren't really aware of the way that it's being used. Um, and the fifth one at the moment is prochlorperazine or phenergan, which is an anti-nausea medication that we use um, uh, for lots of reasons. And so, and what I'm learning in this room, what we're learning is, and people are talking to us here in a very different way than they do in any other clinical setting that I've been in. Um, what I'm learning is that um, when people have a tolerance to a certain amount of heroin um, or fentanyl or whatever opioid, that they can um, not get additional euphoria or high, but they can get additional sedation. And my patients basically say, I am trying to check out. I don't want to see this environment around me. I don't want to exist um, in this world today. Um, I want to be asleep through the most of today. And it's sedation that they're actually after. Um, and that's absolutely happening. So some examples of the kinds of things we're beginning to learn in this room. The cohort who use the program are extremely high risk. They're experiencing repeated overdoses. They are not engaged with healthcare providers in general. Again, the nature of the relationship in the program is very different um, than in any other clinical setting I've been in. Um, and I've just explained to you um, a bit about the cocktail. So we've actually been open now for a little over two years, and I'll say it was um, a battle to be able to open. Um, NPR ran a story that we were planning to do this, and out of the blue, um, that same day, the mayor of Boston had 75 phone calls from people who live in the South End. The governor got asked about it at a press conference in Worcester three days later, and it sort of blew up as something much more controversial than we were naively thinking it would be. Um, and so we had to kind of go back to the drawing board, and for about six months we did a lot of community processing. I think we probably attended 55 community meetings. We brought people into the space. We explained what we were going to try to do, um, and we tried to build some community buy-in, and that eventually happened. Um, so we opened in April of 2016, and in this tiny room with just space for 10 people, We've had, actually at this point now, two years, two and a quarter years in, we've had about 8,000 encounters um, with about 700 unique people. And I think some of the outcomes that most people are interested in are how often do we connect people to treatment. And I'll say that I think there's value in this kind of service, this kind of harm reduction work, even when we can't connect people to treatment. This is a day that they are going to live. There's gonna be a tomorrow. Um, we're going to make sure that they're not going to die. Um, my hope eventually for everyone is that they connect to treatment, but there is value even when that doesn't happen. Um, our success rate in connecting people to treatment in the first year was only about 10%, which doesn't surprise me too much. Um, and by the end of the second year, now we're at 22%. I'll tell you that it happens on average at the 13th encounter, which really says something about building trust and relationship and engagement over time. We just launched a really neat campaign, public campaign, to try to combat stigma, the, the kind of overlapping, intersecting stigmas of homelessness and addiction. It's called the Boston Underdogs Campaign, and we had this amazing marketing firm, Hill Holiday, um, help us out with it. And so if you're interested in hearing a couple stories um, from people who have been to SPOT and learn more about it, you could check, check, check us out on that website. So I'm gonna tell you briefly about a second, um, a second recent intervention that's only about seven months old now um, that is, again, coming from a place of desperation. So despite the fact that, again, we've been trying to lower every barrier we can to um, people being able to access buprenorphine treatment or suboxone treatment, um, we're still finding that there are wait times, even in our clinic. If you walk in and say, I am looking for treatment um, with this medication. It's going to take us about eight weeks to actually write the first prescription. And there are typically hoops that you jump through while you're waiting those eight weeks. And by the way, 
death rates from overdose are the highest in the wait list period for both buprenorphine and methadone. So we um, decided to try something new, um, and we're lucky enough to have um, a, a group of funders um, sort of be willing to pilot this, and this primarily being funded by the Kraft Center for Community Health um, and the GE Foundation and a few others. But we basically decided that we wanted to create a mobile program of addiction treatment in which we would combine a clinical partner, in our case, um, addiction medicine people from our community health center, with a harm reduction partner. The harm reduction partner here is our state's largest syringe exchange program, AHOPE. Um, and that partner, by the way, to me is like absolutely key. Um, we want to be mobile and we want to be able to hotspot. We want to be able to go geographically to the parts of Boston where the most overdoses are happening. So we looked at a ton of maps like this. This is a heat map dated now um, in that it's 2016, but it basically shows you for that year the hot spots of overdose. Um, and this comes from Boston EMS data. These are incidents of uh, what they call narcotic-related illness, which is overdose. And to me, this is a map of homelessness in Boston, although I'm sure that doesn't tell the whole story, because we're looking at, first of all, the part of town where I was telling you about the clustering um, is, uh, is here. I'm going to call it Recovery Road instead of that other moniker. And then lots of these other dots are T-stops, um, T-stations, North Station, South Station. These are places where my patients stay. They use the bathrooms. They're hidden in alleyways of the T-stops that you would never know about. Um, these are also shelters. Pine Street Inn is a small blip on this map, et cetera. Um, and so Dudley Square as well over here is a part of town in which there are fewer outreach services, fewer addiction treatment options. So we basically decided we want to go to these places. We want to kind of take it down to the street level. We want to make it possible to engage with people outside um, networks of injection drug users. We want to learn the networks. We want to be able to find people. And if they don't want treatment right now, there's actually quite a bit that we can do. We can do syringe exchange. We can make sure that they're going to use a clean, unused needle every single time that they inject. We can take the used needles so they're not thrown away because there's no other place to dispose of them. Um, we can distribute Narcan. We can give water. Um, we can give all the rest of the works, so to speak, that it takes to inject heroin um, without the risk of infection. Um, with HIV and Hep C. So we can do a lot, even if someone doesn't want treatment. But if you want treatment, we're going to do it right here, right now. No barriers. I'm going to make sure you have health insurance right here, right now. I'm going to sign you up if you don't. I'm going to take you myself to the pharmacy. We're going to fill this prescription together. We're going to do an induction right here on the street. We're going to just try to get rid of every barrier. And um, this is sort of what our amazing fun van looks like. We got the Winnebago company to um, to build it for us. It has a very small um, examination room in the back. It has a phenomenal kind of Wi-Fi um, uh, router, computer. I have access to Epic, a printer, a label printer. It has a vaccine refrigerator. So at the moment, I'm doing a ton of hepatitis A and B vaccines because there are outbreaks of both of those infections in this exact population. Um, I am able to hand out post-exposure prophylaxis for HIV to start people on pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV. It's sort of like an addiction um, one-stop, doing a ton of wound care, taking care of abscesses um, that people obtain, uh, develop when they inject. In the reception area, that's sort of the part where most of the syringe exchange work is happening. And by the way, I'm learning so much. We're learning so much in doing this project. We're learning that there are so many people who never make it into the doorways of our hospitals and community health centers. Um, and we're learning about things like secondary syringe exchange, where if you can engage a key person in a network of injection drug users, that person is willing to take more needles distributed in their network, bring back more from their network, and the same thing with Narcan. So this is sort of what our, our version of patient-centered care looks like. We go out in teams of three and four, the prescriber um, and the outreach workers 
public health advocates from the syringe exchange program. We tend to park in a very quiet, try to be subtle place, um, and then we blanket a neighborhood. We are mostly working in alleyways. Um, we bring people back to the van when that's necessary. I think I'm not gonna bore you with some of our early um, data because it's only been about six months now, um, but you'll see in these different neighborhoods that we're going to some of these hot spots. Um, we've actually distributed quite a few needles and we're actually bringing back more than that. So our exchange rate is about 112% right now. Um, we've distributed close to 1,000 Narcan kits. Um, we're having clinical encounters now with um, about 100 people so far. And actually, I should tell you, we're, we're only working half time on the van. So at the moment, we've started and, and have a census of about 30 patients on buprenorphine, and we're prescribing it even in a very different way. It's, we'll call it sort of low threshold buprenorphine. Low threshold to start to try it, um, to keep working with people beyond relapse. Um, and um, that's sort of what we're, we're interested in doing. So where do we go from here? <laughs> Um, which is really kind of the interesting topic of the day. Um, I would say, first and foremost, that we need a massive infusion of resources for this epidemic to manage it in this country, um, something akin even to the Ryan White Care Act. Um, we obviously need a multifaceted approach, and I would add continuing to try to tackle stigma with public campaigns, um, and the stigma not only of the addiction itself, but the stigma associated with the treatments like buprenorphine and methadone. I think there can be a lot done, as Dr. Kaladny also um, alluded to, on the prevention side, um, but I am so far downstream that I'm focused right now on expanding access to low barrier treatment. And finally, and I think just as importantly, on harm reduction. I think these services play a crucial and complementary role, really, in a, in a treatment continuum. I think we have to be willing to build trusting relationships with people who use drugs um, that might need to take us out of our comfort zones. I think there's, there's the offer of um, the promise of discovering and tailoring interventions that have high impact that we should be testing everywhere right now. And then finally, um, as part of a, a robust harm reduction strategy, I, I do think that in certain parts of the US and certain, um, in certain urban areas in particular, that supervised injection or, uh, or supervised consumption sites um, make a lot of sense. And I'm happy to say a little more about those in the discussion period. I think I'm gonna stop here. Thank you. So I'm going to start us off with a couple of questions. Um, first question relates to a lot of the work that we do at Portal, which is uh, drug pricing. Um, we do have some concerns about price increases and high costs. So as I mentioned, Narcan being acquired by another company, concern that mergers often lead to price increases soon after acquisitions. And then also concern about the president's plan to include Vivitrol, which is, of course, a very expensive branded medication as part of the response. Do you guys have any thoughts about that? So uh, on, let me start with Vivitrol. And uh, you know, there are three medications that are used for treating opioid uh, addiction, buprenorphine, methadone, and extended re release naltrexone, uh, which is uh, uh, called Vivitrol. And um, you know, we don't really have good evidence to tell us um, how to position the treatment, which medicine is right for for which patient. Um, and and unfortunately, you know, what we hear from the National Institutes of Drug Abuse or the um, uh, or from American Society of Addiction Medicine, when they discuss the different medications, often they talk about all three as if they're all equal, like they don't want to pick favorites. And, you know, that's not a good idea because even though we don't have great evidence about how to position treatment, we do have evidence that opioid agonist treatment, treatment with buprenorphine and methadone maintenance is more effective um, and uh, uh, than, than Vivitrol. The um, problem with Vivitrol is that um, you see very high dropout rates and the manufacturer um, sat on the results of um, a registry trial 
with about 400 patients that showed that within the first few months of treatment, about 75% of the patients had dropped out. Uh, they didn't come back for, for their I injection. And um, when, uh, if you give somebody uh, naltrexone, the brain, one of the ways in which the brain compensates by having its opiate receptors blocked is that it, it upregulates opiate receptors. It produces more opiate receptors, which isn't a problem uh, having a brain with lots of extra opiate receptors if you get your injection every month. But if you miss your injection and you have a brain with lots of extra opiate receptors, you've created some an, an individual who's super sensitive to opiates. Um, it's somebody who um, doesn't just have a normal tolerance, like someone who got out of jail. You've made them super sensitive. And there are many reports now, including one published paper, showing high rates of deaths in patients treated with, with uh, Vivitrol. We don't have good evidence about how to position the treatments where I where I, based on, on my clinical experience and, and the, the evidence we do have, I think extended release naltrexone makes some sense in patients who haven't been addicted for very long, a young person who's been dabbling, short history of opioid addiction, low physiological dependence on opioids. It's worth giving the, the medicine a try, but in patients with moderate to severe opioid use disorder, for example, heroin injectors are the type of patient you're more likely to encounter in the criminal justice system. These are patients who are better, more appropriately treated with buprenorphine or methadone maintenance, and yet in the criminal justice system is where you, you see a very strong bias against opioid agonist treatment and, um, you know, drug court judges who will say, you know, we're only going to use Vivitrol in our, our court, in, in our drug court program. And the manufacturer has been very good about playing up the fears um, of buprenorphine and methadone, and they've been very effective on Capitol Hill, which is why we had inserted into federal legislation sort of... Uh, uh, not even equal footing for Vivitrol, but really um, giving the uh, promoting uh, uh, extended release naltrexone. I'm um, just on on Narcan, and and we've got the expert here, so I'd, I'm going to really uh, defer to Jesse on this. But uh, we've made very good progress in the United States over the past 10, 15 years in ex making naloxone more available. Um, and in many municipalities, it's carried by first responders. It's being distributed by syringe exchange programs. Um, it's and there are other states that have made it, put it, made it available over the counter. And um, all of that is sort of a no-brainer. We absolutely have to do that, and we have to keep doing it, and we could do even better. Um, any place, you know, even even in a Starbucks, there should be naloxone because people are overdosing in, in the restroom there on, on, on airplanes. I mean, we should be doing this. But despite these great efforts, and despite the fact that we're saving many lives by making naloxone more available, as you know, it's opioid crisis has really been con continuing to worsen. And so it's necessary but not sufficient. If you rescue somebody with naloxone and you don't see that they get treated for their opioid addiction, you just have to hope somebody's around with naloxone the next time they, they overdose. And many overdoses occur without a peer around or without somebody who can rescue you. And many, many deaths occur in people's sleep, particularly prescription opioid deaths. People don't wake up in the morning. There is no opportunity to administer naloxone. So it's only going to get us so so far. Uh, I just, I, I thought I would tell you how much Narcan costs at the moment. I'm terrified about the cost going up um, with, with, this, with this shift. Um, so um, a year ago, um, we were paying the, um, directly the, um, the company that makes the high-dose Narcan, which is what you need in Massachusetts. These are four uh, milligrams of Narcan in, one, in a 0 0.1 cc of fluid, which is just very potent. And I typically need three of these to reverse one overdose right now. That tells you a lot about the supply here. But uh, a box of two of these um, was costing us $150. So we have to buy them for our staff. Our patients are mostly covered by Medicaid. Um, we do have some people without health insurance that we buy these for, and it was costing us $150. Recently talked them down to a public interest price of $75 a box. So it's still actually really costly, especially when you think of how much we're going through here. So, um, and, and that's like considered a, a great price, $75 for dollars for eight milligrams of Narcan. So I'm very worried about it going up. And I think the Department of Public Health is as well in Massachusetts. Uh, 
A related question. Uh, what are your thoughts on the FDA's role, both in creating and mitigating the opioid crisis? And do you agree with their approach to new opioid drug approval, which is largely centered around the development and approval of abuse deterrent formulations of opioids? So um, I don't think, I honestly do not believe that we would have an opioid addiction epidemic today if the FDA had been doing its job properly, if it had properly enforced existing federal law, um, I don't believe we'd be here. Um, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, uh, and Aaron is really an expert on, on this, but um, the, uh, what, what that law says is that a drug company um, is not allowed to promote a, uh, a medication for conditions where it hasn't been proven safe and effective. And um, if FDA had been enforcing that law, when Purdue introduced OxyContin, and it really hits the market in 96, it uh, gets approved in 95. Um, had they properly enforced the law, they would have told Purdue, great, you've got extended release oxycodone. The, the benefits of that drug uh, may outweigh its risks when it's used in palliative care. Um, we're going to give you an indication for palliative care. We're going to let you send your sales reps and um, out to the hospices and, and to the oncologist's offices and the palliative care docs. But um, you don't, there is no evidence that the benefits outweigh the risks when it's used for low back pain with a normal spine, chronic headache, fibromyalgia, uh, wisdom teeth extraction. Um, the, the risks sound like they outweigh the benefits, and we don't have ev evidence of safety and efficacy. So no, we're not going to let you promote for those uh, conditions. Had they done that, I don't think we would be here uh, today. But they didn't do that. And um, uh, very uh, immediately, Purdue was promoting OxyContin. And other opioid manufacturers with their opioids started to do do the same thing for, for long-term use as safe and effective. And FDA allowed that. And by 2002, it was very clear the prescribing had taken off at a level far greater than clinically could be clinically needed. There were reports of overdose deaths and addiction coming out of New England and Appalachia. And you know, members of Congress were beginning to hear from constituents, and FDA is beginning to hear from members of Congress, and they, they start to hold hearings and they start to hold an advisory, they hold an advisory committee uh, meeting, and they invite some experts to consult um, to, to sit on this advisory committee. Um, and they ask the experts a couple of good questions. They said, you know, should we narrow the indications so that the drugs can't be promoted so broadly? Um, and should we change the way we're approving these drugs? Because at this point, lots of drug companies like this model of taking an old generic drug, repackaging it as an extended release and promoting it for chronic pain. It's, it's become a billion dollar blockbuster drug for Purdue. They want to get their, their product. So a lot of companies have their applications in. And, and FDA says, should we be changing the way we're approving them and should we narrow the indication? And the experts who they brought together to consult happened to be some of the same experts who were leading this campaign in the medical community to increase uh, prescribing who had, you know, helped usher in the pain as the fifth vital sign and, and had been teaching the medical community that we shouldn't worry about the, the risk of addiction. And, and so they asked the champions of this crusade for more opioid prescribing, should we better regulate the manufacturers, experts who were getting paid by the manufacturers? And of course they said, no, don't change a thing. And the FDA actually went in the opposite direction. Instead of making it harder for new opioids to enter the market, they changed the way clinical trials were being done uh, to demonstrate efficacy in a way that made it much easier. And we wound up with a steady stream of new opioids. And each time a new opioid hit the market, the manufacturer, you know, it costs a lot of money to bring a drug to, to market. The only way you're going to recoup that investment is by getting doctors to prescribe your new product. And the only way they're going to know about your new product is if you're out there promoting it, with the, uh, visiting doctors and advertising it. And so each time a new opioid hit the market, it was like pouring fuel on the fire. And now to, uh, the FDA still hasn't really changed anything. They're sort of latching on to abuse deterrent formulations, which are really not much better than a gimmick. Uh, making a pill harder to crush for snorting or injecting is not making that active ingredient any less addictive. Uh, this was a question uh, submitted via Twitter a few days ago. Um, how do you propose balancing reducing opioid abuse and illegal use with reducing the stigma for those who need opioids for chronic pain and who use them properly and responsibly? Um, 
So, uh, I mean, I think the way that question is framed suggests really a misunderstanding of, of, the, of the opioid crisis. And there are many people with chronic pain um, who believe, and they've um, been led to believe this in part, um, who believe that they're being punished for the bad behavior of the drug abusers. You know, where we take our opioids responsibly, opioids are helping us, and there's that po there are those drug addicts. I, I hate that term, but that's basically what they say. And we're patients, not addicts, and because of those addicts, um, we're having a harder time, and so that there should be this balanced approach. Um, what about us? And um, the reality is these individuals who are on uh, chronic opioids, particularly those who are on very high doses, are beginning to have a harder time finding doctors who will continue them on, on such high doses. And it is very hard for people to, to come off. And the medical community is beginning to get the message that we shouldn't have put all of these people on opioids. Um, but we're, you know, that doesn't mean that opioids are really helping them. Um, some of these people who are doing okay, I believe they're doing okay despite being on opioids, not because of the opioids. And I don't believe we should be forcing them off of opioids now that we've realized we made this horrible uh, mistake. I think a good way of thinking about this is um, if you think about estrogen replacement therapy. Uh, when I was in medical school um, working in the uh, primary care clinic as a medical student, we were taught basically to twist the arms of our patients, um, postmenopausal women, and get them on estrogen replacement therapy. And, and we were told that, we were taught that when they said, well, what about increased risk of breast cancer, to let them know that there really isn't good evidence suggesting that, it, and, and heart disease is the biggest killer of women, and this is gonna lower your risk of, of heart disease. And we put every, one, every, every patient, and when you got a woman to agree to go on it, you felt like you did something good. And a couple of years you know, later, you know, in 2002, I think a paper comes out, uh, I think in JAMA, and w the medical community figures out, wow, we were, boy, were we wrong. It wasn't a, a, an insignificant increased risk of, of breast cancer. There was a very significant increased risk of estrogen sensitive breast cancer, and it wasn't reducing risk of heart disease, and, and almost on a dime, we were able to stop. And when you look at the epidemiology of estrogen sensitive breast cancer, you can see where, you know, the medical practice begins to change, and you see estrogen-sensitive breast cancer rate starts to, to drop. We're at a similar point with opioids. The difference is we can't really stop on a dime. Millions of these people who were put on long-term opioids, really victims of our era of aggressive prescribing, are not going to be able to come off easily simply because we figured out that we made a horrible mistake, and we haven't really had a good discussion or good policies really about how to address the needs of that population. Um, I mean, I, I do think that there is a place for opioids in treating chronic pain. I think there are patients who need opioids for chronic pain to be able to function. Um, I think we've gone way overboard as a prescribing community. Um, I think we have not recognized just how high the risks are um, as we've initiated opioids over actually now many decades. Um, and I think that that's getting better. I do think there's a balance. Um, I still don't think we're we're there yet, though. I think we're we're. I, my own personal opinion is we we are probably still over prescribing, um, more than more than we should be. I think we're. I mean, I have a skewed vantage point because I see the risk side. I'm way downstream, um, uh, but I also recognize that. Um, there are there is some pain for which chronic opioid therapy is helpful and it helps people function well. So I think there is a balance, um, but I don't think we've we've reached where we need to be yet. Okay. And we'll, we can open it up for audience questions. We're we're kind of running out of time, but maybe if there are a few questions, I can take a few, and then we can have our experts respond to all of them. So any hands? Thank you. Hi, I'm the Director of Patient Advocacy at Boston Medical Center, so we live this daily as well. Thank you both very, very much. I'm just wondering about um, supervised injection facilities. What are the current barriers to having them legislated, and are those barriers insurmountable, or will we see them? A couple more. Thanks, Aaron. Hi, my name is Martha Yorchak. I'm at Brigham and Women's Hospital in charge of the Ethics Service. The data you reported in France about buprenorphine availability was very impressive, and I wonder if you can speak to um, what are the resistances here, and do you see them being overcome? 
Thanks. Hi, I'm Corey Gerlach. I'm a PhD student at Harvard Medical School. And I was wondering, um, Dr. Gaeta, you talked about treatment. And I was wondering what, how you define treatment and whether you mean patients that are taking Vivitrol or whether you're talking about 12-step programs. And uh, to both of you, just what do you think? Do you think this is a problem that could be solved by the medical community and the drug industry alone? Or is there a role in, in 12-step programs and things like that? That's a lot. Um, so we start with the question about um, supervised injection. You asked really about barriers, and I would say that, um, I mean, so legally there are there is a Federal Controlled Substances Act that has a crack house statute um, created um, in the late 80s, really in response to um, a cocaine epidemic, um, that makes it illegal for anyone to operate a facility in which um, an illegal substance is used. So there's a federal law that um, is in place um, to prevent that from happening. And then each state has its own Controlled Substances Act. And in Massachusetts, we have a very similar statute to the Crack House statute. And so the barriers, and I'm, I'm just going to tell you the local barriers in, in this state, although it's a little bit different in California, a little bit different in New York, a little bit different in Philadelphia, and in uh, Washington state right now. Those are the places that are sort of leading on this, um, on this possibility. In Massachusetts, um, I think one, one strategy that I think we need at this point in the epidemic, especially that it's especially to address the fentanyl epidemic, I think we need to be able to be with people at the point of injection because fentanyl is so fast acting. Um, and so I, I would I would argue that we could ask our state legislature or our governor for um, an amendment in the setting of a um, public health crisis to um, at least pilot um, a medically supervised injection facility. Um, I think that there's more than enough evidence from other countries where these facilities exist to, to strongly suggest that the outcomes would be favorable. Um, but even if that happened, and of course there's, um, you know, there's, um, I think that the legislature in Massachusetts struggles with this. I think the administration struggles with this. But even if we were to convince our state legislators and elected officials to try this, we then have, would have to have some level of reassurance from the federal government that they wouldn't come in to stop. And, and actually the opposite is true. So we now have um, the U.S. <laughs> General's office very explicitly in the New York Times two weeks ago, um, threatening anybody who tried to open such a facility of being shut down and jailed. So there's quite a bit of barrier right now on the federal level. Um, I'd say there's less barrier in a few different states. Massachusetts is one of them. So the governor's most recent Opioid um, Care Act 3.0 that passed this past uh, in, in mid-August. It. There was an addendum um, that, uh, or an amendment to that law that almost squeaked through um, to um, ask the state to, um, to pilot a SIF. Um, it got watered down to creating a commission to look at the possibility and the feasibility of opening a SIF in Massachusetts. And that commission is supposed to give recommendations to the legislature in February. Um, but, so there's quite a bit of barrier. And I think the main thing that people struggle with in this concept is, um, and I, I hear this all the time, is that they worry that um, if you open a facility like this, that people will be enabled to use um, heroin. They will somehow encourage use even. Um, and I just have the exact opposite view, that the use is happening anyway. And in my world, it's happening in, in, in very dark alleyways and in bathrooms and in places where there's some um, privacy and trying to sort of escape. Um, and so I, I think we need to bring it out of that shadow and into the light. I think I've got so many examples of cases from spot where someone walks out that day. I know they're going to use, they know they're going to use. I want to be able to say to them, you know what, you have worth, um, and, um, I'm just going to be with you today, even though that's what, that's, what's going to happen. Just stay. You're going to be safe. I'm going to keep you here. I don't know what will happen in the future, but right now, at this injection, you are not going to die. <laughs> um, so, any case, quick answer about barriers to SIF legally and then just in terms of public opinion and stigma about that intervention. There's the evidence base for SIFs from other countries um, is pretty dramatic, and they've actually ways to try to study this enabling question um, that I think have 
um, more than given us of enough evidence that, that we should be trying this right now um, in the U.S. in the middle of a fentanyl epidemic. Do you have anything on that one? Or? Um, I, uh, I'd like to see uh, some CIFs piloted in uh, urban areas. Um, I don't. Uh, I agree with you that um, they wouldn't um, enable or uh, it's not government sanctioning use. I, I don't see any downsides to SIFs, and I think they um, could potentially be helpful. Um, the, the data isn't as clear as it is, for example, with syringe exchange, and the um, and uh, we understand that syringe, clean syringes uh, can reduce uh, HIV infection. It not, doesn't work as great for hep, hep C, but we, we had good evidence uh, on syringe exchange. We don't have the same evidence, and some of their papers are, are conflicting, but I think we should be piloting this. I get a little concerned by, um, you know, it, because of the controversy a around it, um, uh, I think it can be a distraction. And while I do think that they'd be useful in urban areas where people are injecting in public spaces, where you have needle parks, um, and, and I do think that they could be good uh, places to link people to, to treatment, um, some of the debate is all raging in places where I think there, it makes no sense for a safe injection facility, like Ithaca, New York. Um, in rural or suburban communities, I don't believe people are going to commute into town multiple times a day. Um, even though it might be safer to inject with, in a supervised area, I don't think they'd uh, use them. I think they'd. I don't think they'd risk being seen by their their neighbors. And I, I think where people have homes, even though it's riskier, I think many people would would inject there. And I think that they'd sit empty. And yet in Ithaca, New York, you had this debate raging between the mayor and the harm reduction community, and the press was covering this. And meanwhile, in Ithaca, New York, there was a waiting list for people to access buprenorphine treatment with people dying of overdoses on that waiting list. And I'm not sure what the mayor was doing about that. Yet, you know, he was the champion of the harm reduction community for proposing a safe injection facility in a place where I think it would have sat empty. So I think, I think the, the focus on it, uh, I think, we, you know, the media likes to focus on um, controversial issues, um, but I think the discussion is a little bit of a distraction. There are things we could be doing that we're not doing that would be saving lives, um, that, that I think would save many more lives. Second question. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good lead into the second question. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the case in France and whether, whether there are barriers to implementing that similar scenario here in the US. So I, I think the single biggest barrier and what really more than anything else makes uh, the United States different from France, there, there are different barriers to, to be roughing like patient caps. Uh, for a while, we wouldn't let uh, physician extender, you know, nurse practitioners or physicians, physicians assistants prescribe. Um, uh, there are different barriers. and We don't have really good addiction treatment integrated into primary care, but I think the single biggest barrier, the biggest problem is the eight-hour training requirement. Um, not that it's bad for people to learn about a medication before uh, prescribing it, but when you have an eight-hour training requirement um, and a waiver process where a doctor then has to uh, apply to the federal government, what happens is m most prescribers will never take that course, and in the United States, only 94% of 94% uh, of physicians are not eligible to to prescribe. And um, so what that means is that a patient who's opioid addicted who may want to open up to their primary care doc and say, uh, and discuss this highly stigmatized condition and, and ask that, that prescriber, that physician or, or clinician for help, um, if they do that, um, many don't, but if they do that, and the, the, in, in all likelihood, their primary care clinician is going to have to say, well, let's find you some place to go. If it weren't for that eight-hour training requirement, that primary care clinician could say, well, let's figure out how to get you on this medicine. Maybe I need to learn a little bit about it, but we'll, we'll, I'll try and do it. And it'd be far easier to integrate this into, into primary care settings. So more than any other barrier, I think that's, the, that's what makes us different uh, from, from France, where doctors just started to prescribe it. I will mention that in, in France, it wasn't a perfectly rosy story. Um, they were using Subutex, which is the pure buprenorphine, which is the easier to inject version. You can still inject suboxone buprenorphine with, with naloxone in it, um, but it's a little less attractive for injection use. Um, and a lot of it did wind up diverted onto the black market. People, you can get a high if you inject it. Um, and um, there was a fair amount of injection use, but because the pharmacology of buprenorphine is, is unique, it's a partial agonist, even if you're injecting it, 
it's pretty difficult to, to overdose on it. And, and so the overdose death rate dropped. And of course, many people who got it weren't injecting it, but were taking it appropriately in a way in which it dramatically improved the quality of their life and their ability to function. I just mentioned a couple other barriers in addition to the, the training um, that you focused on. I mean, one is, is stigma. I think the, uh, we've talked about this already a couple of times. The opiate agonist treatments both are just highly stigmatized by law enforcement. They're actually still stigmatized by the DEA. And if you just look at the, the way that um, the regulation in place uh, around both the prescribing of buprenorphine and, and even more so methadone, um, it, they make it difficult to provide these treatments. I mean, it is just an example. As a primary care doctor, I've had at least three now random um, visits from a DEA officer to um, to ask me in a, in a very intimidating way about what I'm doing to prevent diversion and how I'm making sure that I'm below my cap of X number of patients and that type of thing. So it's um, the, the message is, is very different with the prescribing of these medications than anything else that we prescribe. Um, and, the, and the stigma exists even among patients and in families where there's worry that if you're using an open agonist to treat addiction that, 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 that it's not, no different than uh, that person taking heroin, for example, when it's, it's absolutely different. In fact, just by the very definition of addiction being compulsive use of a substance despite harm, when the compulsion goes away, um, so the behaviors change and the, and the very nature of addiction itself um, uh, it can go away for some people, and that's what we're aiming for. Um, but there's a lot of stigma even beyond the... Um, uh, there's a lot of stigma in society about these treatments. There's other issues too, which is that, um, I think just from the point of view of a primary care doctor, that um, this is very intensive work. Um, it's not unlike treating chronic, complex heart disease. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I need a team of people to help me do this. Um, I, I can't do it alone. Um, in fact, even some of the regulation around what's expected of me every time I write that prescription is, you know, that visit is taking me much longer than so many other things I do. Um, I think um, tr combining buprenorphine, for example, with office-based behavioral therapies, like cognitive behavioral therapy is ideal, and yet the opportunity to do that um, is limited by space and resources and additional team members. Um, so I think, like, f there are some logistical reasons why it can be hard or overwhelming to have a lot of patients on buprenorphine in your practice as a primary care doc. Um, so there, there are a lot of barriers still. Sorry, I think we're unfortunately uh, at the end of our time. So thank you very much to the experts and the moderator. And thanks, everybody, for coming.